small work yes perfect yeah so before we start the session let me ask you uh, a very generic question that we usually ask ourselves okay yeah so let me ask you students if my audio and video is clear so here is your poll okay so I, so if my voice and my my face and the screen that is presented is clear for you then we are good to go to class if not please let me know so that we can check our technicalities all right youtube students i hope you you are able to listen to me uh, clear and well and the stream is good if you have any concerns at all please let me know through the comments comment section okay there is a chat box you can just uh, put your concerns in the chat box so that will help us carry on without any delay okay okay let me just pinpoint okay also we have uh, bhavan uh, bhavnagar jnv bhavnagar uh, students of bhavnagar can you just confirm about the technicalities if the video and audio is clear oh. All right. Yeah. So I really need your confirmation. Please tell me if the audio and video is clear. And I think the polls are on your screen. Okay. So let me just check. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now you see it becomes so easy for us to go on with our class. Right. So yeah. It's been a week time and now we have to really pick up very important topics because understanding these topics would uh, give us a very crucial understanding uh, to solve our uh, questions that are coming in our NEET examinations. Okay. And very, very important topics. Students, I know that in the past classes we studied and I also told that those are also important concepts. Yes, they are important concepts, but without understanding them, it would uh, become very hard for you to build that foundation, right? So what's really happening? Anyways, so today's topic, we have something called as linkage, okay? So before we head on directly to linkage, okay, all of a sudden, so let's revise a little bit. So if you see in the prior classes, what did we talk about? So in the, in the prior classes, we really talked about chromosomal, uh, you know, inheritance. And we talked about the contributions of the scientists of, in discovering the chromosomal inheritance, right? So we had Walter Sutton, Theodore Burberry, and then we had Thomas Morgan Hunt. So all these people, they were contributing uh, in understanding what else are the probabilities of non-Mendelian genetics. Uh, why sometimes uh, there is, uh, you know, no proper uh, results that we can get. For example, if you see the uh, Mendelian dihybrid cross, the phenotypic ratio has to be 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. But you know that mathematics, right? So if I tell you uh, that the pi value is 22 by 7, nobody in your class would argue with me again, uh, no, sir, it is not 22 by 7, right? So you will agree to that. This is one universal ratio. So this is it. That's it, right? So similarly, uh, when we talk about mathematical ratios and whenever the mathematical ratios change, so that becomes a problem. Uh, that means there are other possibilities also. So that is why um, these people's contribution is very, very important to uh, complete the circle of understanding uh, the principles of inheritance and variation. Anyways, so we talked about this and then we talked about why they chose Drosophila as an ideal organism to work upon in their genetic laboratory, right? And then we went on to study sex determination and we also understood who is the person or who is the scientist who is uh, credited uh, for uh, sex determination, like for uh, discovering sex determination through chromosomal uh, inheritance. 
uh, Helkin, that's what we talked about. And under Crow, under six determination, we were talking about XXXO type and what are the possibilities and how it is called, right? And then we talked about XXXY type. And then we had uh, ZZZW type, right? And then finally, uh, we also, I also tried to talk to you about the chromosomal number based, uh, you know, uh, what do you tell, sex determination, taking honeybee as an example, correct? So now, since we have studied this, if you have any doubts, okay, regarding this, we still have today and we have tomorrow also, right? So don't worry. Uh, we can just come back and you can just post me a, a question uh, in the class or after the class, okay, or tomorrow's class. Just make sure that if you have any doubts that uh, you ask me, okay, that's very, very important. Anyways, so let's get back to our today's topic, current topic, hot topic, okay? So what do we have here? We have sex-linked inheritance in Drosophila, okay? So we understood why they chose Drosophila specifically to work upon. So when Morgan was trying to work upon Drosophila, he was very, very smart in many ways, like our um, genius Mendel, even Morgan is a very uh, you know, mindful scientist. So how do we say this? See, Morgan was trying to work with characteristics that is true. And you know what are characteristics? Anything that is expressed as traits, that are, those are called as characteristics. So when he was working, he exactly knew where the genes are present for what character he was looking for. For example, if he is working on red eye color or the eye color of the drosophila or the body color of the drosophila or the wing size of the drosophila, uh, our Morgan exactly knew uh, where these genes, I mean, like not where, uh, I can tell on which chromosome these genes was present. And Morgan is, I cannot just tell, okay, Morgan is a guy. Morg, al Morgan, along with him, even his students should be credited for the whole of uh, what is the outcome of this particular experiment. So let us study this experiment and understand uh, what are we really talking about today. So here we have, Whenever we conducted dihybrid cross, so when we talk about the dihybrid cross our Mendel conducted, we understand that he took the character six, di means two characters, so he took R, R, Y, Y, and he crossed it with small r, small, small r, small y, small y. And I am writing this so that you remember what we are really talking about. Okay, so R and we talked about L1 round, wrinkled and green, correct? Do you remember? So, and we also constructed a Punit square. And finally, after F2 generation, okay, after F2 generation, what did we get? We got this ratio called as 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1, right? As the phenotypic ratio. That means in the F2 generation, 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1, uh, where the uh, different variants that we can easily observe in these pea plants and get a ratio. Now, if I conduct a similar dihybrid cross in another organism, okay, let us say uh, like our Morgan did, we take Drosophila and we conduct a dihybrid cross taking two characters at a time. what would be the outcome to us or consequences or what is happening here. So now you have draws of law. The major thing is, okay. So first one we have is the wild variety of drosophila. We take two different types of drosophila, like the male plant and the female plant. Similarly, we take wild variety of drosophila and then we have another variety called as mutated drosophila or mutated variety of drosophila. Now wild variety means naturally available, like which is quite common and which is very, very natural. Uh, those are called as wild variety. And mutated drosophila are the ones which are uncommon uh, because of sudden changes, they just sh start showing characteristics. So these are called as mutated drosophila. So in wild variety of drosophila, we had this following characteristics. The wild variety of drosophila had red eyes, it had brown body color, and it also had normal uh, size of the wing. Understood? Whereas the mutated drosophila had white eyes, 
a low body and then it had short wing or it is also called as miniature wing students. Now, let us see what happens if we conduct this cross. Now, if we conducted dihybrid cross, no conducted a dihybrid cross, he conducts two, he call it as cross A and other one he call it as cross B. Now, coming to cross A. So what do we have in cross A? I'll write it here, cross A. So in cross A, what Morgan chose was, he chose eye color, eye color, and other one was body color. Okay, body color. So in eye color, we already know that it is red or white. Okay, red and white is the eye color. And when it comes to body color, we know that we have brown body, brown body, and then we have yellow body, isn't it? See here. We have brown body and then we have yellow body. So we'll write it here. So we have yellow body. All right. So this is a dihybrid cross. Correct. One is the eye color. Other one is the body color. So since we are taking two characteristics at a time, we call it as a dihybrid cross. And the variants of this dihybrid cross are very, very simple. One is the eye color is red or white. Or we have the brown, uh, you know, body color is brown and yellow. So usually we go for the dominant that is red and brown in one side. And then we have white and yellow on the other side and we conduct the cross. So now what happens? See here we have the parents. So we have the yellow and white parents and then we have the red and brown parents and we cross them. Now what happens? We get the F1 generation. Okay. Now after F1 generation, they go for the F2 generation or the F2 cross by self-crossing them. Okay, wild type was crossed with uh, yellow and white. Again, self-cross will happen. Now, when this crossing happens between the, you know, between the population, now what do we get? We had the F2 generation. In F2 generation, something... very unique happens. So what happens in F2 generation is students. So if you are to three is to one Drosophila, the Drosophila never showed this nine is to three is to three is to one uh, ratio at all. In, in fact, it didn't even come close to uh, what Mendel had uh, given the, uh, you know, numbers. It didn't even close, come close together. Instead, he has found something very, very unique. What he found was, let us say that we have hundred, uh, Anyways, okay. So let me. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, somebody has to make me a host package. Okay, hold on. Give me a second, give me a second. JNV Bhavnagar, are you are you able to listen to me? Please, can you make me yeah reclaim host? Hold it, hold on. Yeah, perfect. So I'm sorry about the technical error. Let's get back here. Okay. So give me a second. Yes, I hope it's in the YouTube. Yeah, it's also fine let me just check once one second cross cross uh, we talked that in cross a we had this f2 generation and in f2 generation we absorbed that uh, we didn't get 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 ratio but instead what we had was the parental variety was 98.7 percent and the recombinant type was 1.3 percent now what is this parental type and what is this recombinant type now, when we look at ourselves and then we compare it with our parents, it's very, very simple example that we can present to you. So you can see that uh, some of you are quite identical to your father or you're very quite identical to your mother. Whereas uh, some of you, uh, you might be very unique, like, oh, how am I? Uh, like completely not matching even a little bit of similarities with my parents I have very very less similarities with my parents so now whoever look like your parents and whoever like have the characteristics or traits of your parents so you people are parental varieties whereas the people who are unique or the people who just don't resemble many of the characteristics of their parents, but they have their own characteristics, that is new characteristics. So they are called as recombinant types. Okay, now we have the recombinants and we have the uh, parental types, got it? So let's get back. So in here, in the population of the F2 generation, what he observed was 98.7% of the individuals were looking exactly like parents, whereas only 1.3% were looking like their uh, you know, uh, new ones. So now this is quite uh, unique, isn't it? It's not nine is to three is to three is to one anymore. It is something different. So now what is happening? Now he does not stop here. He goes for cross B. Now, what does he do in cross B? We have cross B, I'll write it here. We have cross B. In cross B, he takes two characteristics again. What are the characteristics? One is body color, body color. Other one is wing size. Okay. You know what are wings, right? Something which is used for flying. Okay. 
So wing size. So body color, we already know the varieties. One is the brown body and then we have the yellow body. Whereas the wing size, we have long wings and then we have miniature wings. Okay, we have long wings and then we have miniature wings. So now he takes again two different characteristics and he goes for cross B. Again, he, did, he, did, he does what? He does F1 generation comes. Okay, after he chooses the parent and he crosses them. Then it comes F1 generation. After F1 generation, he goes for F2 generation. When he crosses for the F2 generation, now an astonishing results comes. So what does he see? He sees that in a population of 100, okay, let's say the population of 100, almost 62.8% of the population was parental. Whereas, if I, that was around 37. See this, recombinant type increased so much, so many folds compared to that of your crossing. It's, there is no comparison. Again, there is no relevance to what Mendel's dihybrid crosses. Now here, Morgan, I told you in the beginning itself, he was very, very smart. So he understood where the chromosomes were present on which chromosome it was present. Now getting this different numbers in the form of parent varieties and recombinant varieties now what morgan does is something very very beautiful he does not tell that no mendel is wrong his ratios did not appear in my cross so my cross is right he didn't tell that he's told that there is something happening here so what is happening here if you see in cross a you can see that there are dark bands here so the dark bands represents the position of the genes on the x chromosome for the characteristics of eye color and the body color Whereas if you compare the same bands for the cross B, what you can see is the bands are quite far away from each other on the same X chromosome for a different character. What are those? The body color and the wing size bands, you see, they're quite away. Okay, they represent what? The position of the gene on the X chromosome. Now, what is happening, students, here? Now, if you observe carefully, Morgan understood that whenever the genes are quite close together on the low side of a chromosome, they show something called as a very strong physical association or they are uh, attached uh, or they have a very strong force of attraction or physical attraction Okay, uh, with each other. So this is called as a linkage. So what? How, what, how do we define linkage? Linkage is the physical association of a gene on the present on the uh, same low side of a chromosome. Okay, uh, so now, when we have genes which are close together, what is happening here? Now, we have to go back to our basics of cell division. When we are talking about meiosis, so we were talking about recombination. So, in recombination, what is happening? Uh, in recombination, uh, whenever we have the uh, sister chromatids or homologous chromosomes, what happens? They come and cross their arms together. You remember this? They, they, there was this uh, meiosis one, prophase one, and in one of the prophase one phases, we had this crossing over of the arms of the chromosome. So when the arms of the chromosome crossed, you, you understood, you called this chiasmata, a recombinant nodule. Okay, remember these words? So in simple terms, what is happening? The arms of the chromosomes overlap. When the arms of the chromosomes overlap, now here, what is happening? There is a bulk exchange of genetic material happens. What is bulk exchange? Hundreds of uh, hundreds of genes can directly be transferred from one chromosome to another chromosome within, uh, with no exceptions. Whether you're dominant, recessive, doesn't matter. It just goes, washes out to the next chromosome. So this is called as recombination. So, uh, uh, okay, uh, when this recombinant, when, when this recombinant nodule is formed, there is a bulk transfer of DNA. Understood? So, where does this happen? Now, when you have a recombinant nodule formed and then you have a linkage, now the two pass down to the, from, they're exactly passed down from the parents to the offsprings, okay, uh, just like that. Whereas if the genes are quite far from each other, they show a weak linkage. So that results in higher recombination. That means the new characteristics or new DNA or the new base pairs, not new DNA, the new base pairs can be added for the ones which are quite far. 
for the ones which are near nothing could be changed it could just wash out from the uh, uh, you know one chromosome to another chromosome uh, reducing the recombination and preserving the parental type in simple terms let us summarize what is linkage linkage is a physical observ um, you know physical association of the gene present on the chromosome first thing second thing what happens with the linkage strong linkage less recombination less linkage more recombination okay what is recombination recombination is appearance of non parental characteristics in a progeny i told you what are recombinants right so recombination is appearance of non parental uh, characteristics in a progeny is called as recombinants what is recombination bulk transfer of gene uh, uh, in between the chromosomes is called as recombination so now morgan understood something very beautiful now with this knowledge morgan and his students were able to uh, create a tool where uh, we have something called as gene mapping so in gene mapping what do we have we have the capacity to understand or locate the genes where they are present on the particular chromosome so this is a highly credited uh, innovation that they have done understood so this is about linkage and recombination now coming to mutation now mutation is another important aspect of our uh, you know uh, inheritance and variation now sometimes uh, mutation can have a bad face to it and sometimes mutation can also have a good face to it a bad face to it when you read about hiroshima when you he uh, he read about nagasaki when you talk about the hazards of radioactivity when you talk about the hazards of uv radiation when you talk about chernobyl disaster right so you talk about mutations on you tell that oh mutations are very very bad it can lead to cancer it can lead to so many genetic disorders it's quite bad and uh, sometimes you might also have a good face of the mutation or sometimes you will feel like oh uh, x men movie you see and then you suddenly feel like wow i would like to become wolverine or i want to become silver surfer or or you just want to become uh, you know shape shifters or something like that so now you think that oh wow mutations are so great you can become anything yes but you are becoming anything with the with the change in the environment i'll talk about it's so so beautiful so what is happening what is mutation by definition you have a wild gene like for example i have a gene for you know i have a human gene let us say that i have a gene for insulin production let us say that i have a gene, uh, insulin for a particular protein so this particular gene has to be preserved in such a way that to produce so and so protein in such a way now if there is a change in this gene now the specific protein cannot be formed or the same protein cannot be formed in most cases what happens the protein formed will be deformed protein so this can lead to increase in function or loss in function understand this point so what is mutation a sudden change in the genotype of an organism which leads to the phenotypic variation is called as mutation we have a gene change that leads to the protein change the protein change will lead to the expression change correct so that is called as mutation now when we talk about mutation mutation do not occur uh, like that it happens with the help of something so whichever causes mutation is called as mutagens so there are biotic factors there are abiotic factors which causes mutation biotic factors can be you know um, some of the viruses which can cause or induce cancer and abiotic factors like uv radiation radioactivity environmental factors any of the environmental factors you take they can also be considered as mutants or mutagens okay so now when we have the mutation i told you that mutation can lead to two outcomes when we have mutation we can either have uh, the loss of function or we can have uh, the uh, uh, you know gain of function or more function example dwarfism and gigantism you would have heard about dwarfism when you see the people who are not have are tall or they have not grown taller because of the lack of the growth hormone that is or the less growth hormone that is produced in their body so this is called as loss of function sickle cell anemia the ability to produce a quality hemoglobin protein to have a normal red blood cell that is called as loss of function okay or gain of function gigantism people who are 7.5 foot height or 7 feet high so they are very very tall human beings are supposed to be around 57 to 6 okay so let us stick to 57 to 58 let us not go to 6 okay we have our own problems right but if you see uh, some people are extraordinarily tall like around 7 feet and plus so for these people what happened because of the over expression of this gene 
now we have gain of function so uh, to understand mutation on what is loss of function and what is gain of function so this is one way to understand now when we have mutations how does mutation happen so mutations can come of two types one is the point mutation other one is a frame shift mutation now what is a point mutation now read this uh, line uh, i as a normal human being i will have a gene which says ctc so ctc are the base pairs which are present in your dna we'll talk about what are these letters and what do they represent and how significant they are but just understand to to your understanding the ctc is a normal person you tell so instead of ctc now i will take this t and i'll replace it with a when i take this t and i replace it with a now this is a very big problem now why this is a big problem now ctc was supposed to give rise to an rna with a letter called as gag gag but with the replacement of t with a now what has happened it will it has become gug okay so gag become gug now the gag will bring us beta galactose uh, uh, yeah uh, yeah i think so um, okay uh, one second the gag is is supposed to bring a type of an amino acid and the gug will bring a different type of an amino acid here in this case we have valine okay here we have something called as glutamic acid so gag brings us glutamic acid and the gug brings us what it brings us valine so with the just change of this one amino acid the entire protein structure changes and that has resulted in point uh, mutation and the example that we just studied is sickle cell anemia so this is what happens in sickle cell anemia okay we'll, we'll see that in detail now coming to this uh, another type of mutation is frame shift mutation now frame shift mutation is i love to play okay play football this is my uh, words or letters in my gene now what happens i never love to play football okay so now what did i do i just added never now the entire meaning of the uh, you know the gene uh, or the statement changed first thing second thing is it shifted right the reading frame shifted instead of i after i the l has to come instead of that we have i and then i have the first letter as n so this is one problem now i love to play football now i will remove love now what happens i to play football now does it make sense probably a little bit but the, the it does not mean the same thing what i wanted to tell before correct right so that is what is frame shift mutation in frame shift mutation what happens a part of a sequence of a dna is either added or it is deleted so when we add it is called as addition or when it is deleted it is called as deletion in either of the cases the reading frame of the gene changes that leads to the mutation so that is called as frame shift mutation so so we understood what are mutagens we understood what are uh, types of mutation and we understand what is the definition of mutation now is mutation good or bad final question yes mutation has both the faces it is both good and it is both bad in many ways first we'll talk about the bad we have numerous genetic disorders in few minutes we'll be talking about what are mutations and what is the severity of the genetic disorders okay whereas when it comes to goodness of mutation you have two faces of a coin which works for the same goal that is to make you or help you to stay here and for more and more years to come what i mean to say is evolution if you want to, if you want to survive here for a very long time or your progeny has to survive for a very long time they have to have the capacity to adapt to the newer climates newer challenges this earth and the resources present so for that the adaptations comes through one is recombination other one is mutation recombination is very 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 slow step in achieving the change it take, can take hundreds thousands of years for the change to occur whereas if you talk about mutation mutations are sudden changes okay the sudden changes can be life saving or life threatening okay so this is about uh, mutation now let us go to the next topic that is pedigree analysis so tomorrow we are going to solve uh, certain uh, you know uh, questions based on pedigree analysis which is quite important 
but for now we'll just try uh, try to understand the symbols and what is their application pedigree analysis is a symbolic representation of a family tree and this representation will give us an idea to understand whether the family is suffering from a genetic disorder if they are suffering from a genetic disorder what type of genetic disorder it is is it mendelian disorder is it chromosomal disorder how it is transmitted how did this person get from where did he get is that whether it is dominant whether it is recessive whether it is autosomal whether it is sex linked all of these so many questions can be answered just by constructing this family tree understood so how do we do this we do this by giving the symbols to a particular gender or particular uh, situation in different forms for example uh, let's say that we have a husband so he is a male obviously so he will be given as a square symbol right oh sorry i i should not shade here okay it makes sense so female we give a circle and then if they marry then a mating if they marry or mate so we have the one line that as attached between them if they give raise to kids one male and one female kids then we have a box and a circle okay if they have a digos a dizygotic twins then we put a triangle and then we put male and a female then we have a monozygotic twins coming from the same zygote and they have the same gender so we have the two squares with a triangle okay they are interconnected okay and then we have this uh, you know this symbol kite symbol so that says uh, sex unspecified okay so these are certain things now you can see that some of the people who are quite uh, having the genetic disorders you can just shade them and say that okay uh, th these are the ones they are affected and then you just half shade them to show that they are the carriers of them okay so if they are put you know if the female is put a dot here that means she is a carrier of a sex linked recessive disorder or uh, understood so similarly we have so many explanations and so many symbols that can help us understand what is the current situation of a family tree okay with that we can establish uh, what would be the possibilities even in the future generations if they marry certain people we can even establish their family tree for future also understood so that really helps in one thing preventing the genetic disorder second one is understanding the dis genetic disorder and mainly counseling the people who have lots of questions on how did they really get this genetic disorder on in the first place correct so that is why this pedigree analysis is a very very important tool so now let's get back here we have the next topic that is genetic disorders so in genetic disorders they are they can be grouped into two categories one is mendelian disorders other one is chromosomal disorders in simple terms mendelian disorders are such disorders which follow mendelian laws of genetics such as law of dominance law of segregation law of independent assortment understood so these are called as <coughs> mendelian disorders now example for mendelian disorders can be hemophilia color blindness cystic fibrosis sickle cell anemia phenylketonuria thalassemia etc whereas when we talk about the chromosomal disorders in chromosomal disorders they do not follow mendelian laws of genetics okay because of the change in the chromosome number shape okay uh, so these which are called as chromosomal aberration okay so th those are called as chromosomal disorders For example down syndrome kelfelter syndrome or turner syndrome okay so let's see our first example that is hemophilia which is a mendelian disorder in hemophilia hemophilia is also called as the royals disease or it is also called as bleeders disease so what is happening in hemophilia is an individual let's say that they get a cut in the hand so once they get a cut in a hand or a, a bite of a mosquito or just a scratch imagine that they don't stop bleeding if they don't stop bleeding that's a very big problem they're going to lose a lot of blood and it's not good for our body right it's not healthy at all so what happened to these people the, the problem is there is a gene that is present on the x chromosome so which we call it as anti hemolytic factor gene so before we understand what is this gene and what are the functions so first we have to understand what is clotting of blood so when we talked about clotting of blood we talked about one of the elaborate process called as coagulation of blood which you would have heard in your 11th standard book right so when it comes to coagulation of blood it is not a one step process instead it involves around 13 different you, uh, you know factors which has to come in a right place at the right time 
okay so that they get this final product if any of this uh, uh, you know particular factor is missing then it would lead to uh, catastrophic results in uh, you know loss of ability to clot, clot the blood so as i mentioned we have 13 factors okay 13 factors which are named as factor 1 factor 2 and all the way till factor 13 like factor 12 and factor 13 now in these 13 factors we have factor 8 factor 9 and factor 11 and these three factors are called as anti anti hemolytic hemolytic factor so these are called as anti hemolytic factor which is a protein so if this gene 8 gene 9 gene or 10 gene which is present on the sex chromosome if they function they will produce a normal anti hemolytic factor so that will result in proper clotting if a person who is suffering from hemophilia, they will not produce these factors, any one of these factors. If they don't produce factor 8, they will have hemophilia A. If they don't produce factor 9, they will have hemophilia B. If they don't produce factor 11, they will have hemophilia C. So they are labeled like hemophilia A, hemophilia B, hemophilia C, based on what type of gene is defective, correct, right? So now once we have this factor A and factor B and factor C, uh, which are anti uh, which are which are like uh, hemophilia A, B, C, okay? So now uh, these people who have the defective gene will present a specific type of hemophilia where they do not have the capacity to clot the blood. Now, coming back to the uh, nature of this uh, gene, the gene is sex linked. That means it is present on a sex chromosome. As I mentioned, the gene is present on the X chromosome. Okay. And the, and the type of gene is it is a recessive disease. That means you know what is dominant and what is recessive. So recessive is something in a heterozygous condition. If you have a dominant uh, gene, and then if you have a recessive gene, you know that what's going to be expressed. The dominant gene is going to express. Similarly, in hemophilia, when we have a heterozygous condition, when we have a dominant gene over the recessive gene, and the recessive gene is a hemophilic gene, now the healthy hemoglobin, uh, the healthy clotting mechanism will happen in the individual, or in a heterozygous condition. Anyways, okay. Now, uh, coming to the possibility of this disease, the female are the ones who are mostly the carriers of this disease okay so carriers in the sense they only spread the disease but they do not express this disease so those are called as carriers of this disease the extremely rare for the female to get this disease uh, and that happens only if both of our x chromosome have the defective uh, uh, hemolytic gene understood so that is the only possibility where they can get this disease whereas now um, when we talk about the other factor, uh, that is the male factor, the male factor becomes an easy victim for this hemophilia. So let us see what is happening here. What are the dynamics of this disease? Let's say a male and a female marries. The male is uh, properly healthy. If a male is properly healthy, that means he does not have any hemophilic gene. He is a normal hemophilia. Uh, he is a normal uh, guy without any hemophilia problem. And the female uh, will be a carrier of this disease. That means you cannot see her like, uh, showing any of this hemophilic traits or hemophilic character. So she'll look normal and healthy. But without knowing, you marry her. But unfortunately, uh, when uh, when the kids are born, you realize that in the four kids, among four kids, you have some of the kids who have hemophilia, who show hemophilia. And especially the boy kid is showing the hemophilia. So what happened here? When a, marry, when a man married a normal man, when he married okay, a normal looking female, but their kids were affected. Okay, what happened here? The women can look normal and the kids can get hemophilia only when she has one of the chromosomes with a defective gene. When one of the chromosomes has a defective gene that is a hemophilic gene, now what happens is this guy marries. now. Uh, when we just match this, this X sperm will go with this and this X sperm will go with this X egg and this X, uh, Y sperm will go with this, oh, sorry, uh, this X egg and then again, this uh, uh, X egg will go with this sperm. Okay, anyways, so when we see this possibility, we have X dash X 
and then we have xx and then we have normal xy and then we have x dash y so this x dash y is the guy who have the hemophilia or who is showing the traits of hemophilia why did he get this you should remember hemophilia i told that it is present on the x chromosome not on the y chromosome so since he had a defective gene in the X chromosome and the Y chromosome did not have the genes, now the recessive genes will start expressing. That is how the guy becomes hemophilic. Whereas the female who had one of the X chromosome and the other X chromosome was already normal. So the normal X chromosome had a dominant or normal, hemo, normal gene. So it will uh, just suppress this hemophilic gene and it will make the female look healthy. Okay. Uh, and uh, in, inside that she is a carrier of the disease. So here are other possibilities. A hemophilic man marries a female. What is the possibilities? In the next generation, you can see that all of them will look normal. Why? Because both the male will not have the hemophilia gene. Whereas if you see the females, the females will be the uh, all the like entire 100% of the female children who are, or the girl child who is born to them, they will be carriers of this disease. Whereas when you see the final case, where uh, if a man who is suffering from hemophilia marries a carrier of the female, carrier of this uh, disease or a female. So what happens to that? In that 75% of the population are affected. And in, in, in this 100%, one male and one female will definitely be hemophilic. And again, one female will be the carrier of the hemophilia and the other male will be the uh, normal male. So these are the possibilities of the genetic disorders of hemophilia. So let's go for the color blindness. Color blindness is similar to that of the hemophilia, but in this case, we are not talking about the clotting disorder. Here we are talking about the color detecting disorder. Again, the nature of this color blindness is it is a six linked recessive disorder and the gene for this color blindness is present on the X chromosome. The female becomes the carrier and the male becomes the expressor of the disease as simple as that. Now, Color blindness is a disease where a person will not have the capacity to distinguish between the colors. Okay, so that happens between uh, the lack of distinction between one color or two color or more than two, or two colors. So, for example, for some people will not be able to differentiate red or green or blue. Some will not be able to differentiate two colors at a time. Okay, for example, red, green, blue, yellow, etc. Or sometimes all the colors and complete grayness. Okay, this is called as color blindness understood so if you apply the same rules of how the transfer of disease takes place from hemophilia to color blindness so that is uh, absolutely right okay so uh, let's come to the uh, next disease that is sickle cell anemia so when we talk about sickle cell anemia in sickle cell anemia is a point mutation and again here, when we talk about sickle cell anemia, we are not talking about sex-linked recessive disorder. That is an autosomal linked recessive disorder. Okay, it is an autosome. It is an autosome linked. Autosome linked recessive. Sorry. It is an autosome linked recessive disorder. So what is happening with respect to sickle cell anemia? In sickle cell anemia, we'll discuss this. The person will not have a normal red blood cell. Instead of a normal red blood cell, he will have a red blood cell which looks like a sickle shape. You can see here, this shaped red blood cells can be seen. Now, what is normal red blood cell? You know that the normal red blood cell is supposed to have the biconcave shape, right? The, here, the biconcave shape has become sickle cell. Why did this happen? So if you see our hemoglobin, our red blood cells have hemoglobin and the hemoglobin's role is to carry the oxygen. So it is a transporter of oxygen, so which is a very important protein. So here what is happening is in the hemoglobin, we have four chains that is alpha, alpha globulin chain and then we have beta, beta globulin chain. So these globulin chain combine together to give rise to a globular protein. So that is why we call hemoglobin a globular protein. Now, because of the point mutation in one of the genes that, uh, you know, manufactures this uh, chains, so that is what leads to sickle cell anemia. So what are we talking about? So we have this beta globulin chain. So in the beta globulin chain, what is this globulin chain? So it's nothing but the chain of amino acids, which are arranged one after another in a sequential manner. Now, now like this, okay, six, seven, eight and so on okay like this one after another like a beach 
so they are arranged what are arranged amino acids are arranged okay we are talking about proteins right so amino acids are arranged like beads here a specific sequence of amino acid is very very essential now you can see here here we have valin and then and then we have is histidine and then we have leucine and then we have thyronine like this the sequence of amino acids are arranged correct so similarly in the sixth position of the beta globulin chain if you see the beta chain and then if you check that it is a sixth position you can see something in a normal human being you can see that in the sixth position there is glutamic acid whereas in a person who is suffering from sickle cell anemia what is what is he having instead of glutamic acid there is valine so because of this okay that will lead to the change in the shape of the red blood cell so how does it happen so you can see that in the dna so at the position 6 the thymine was replaced by adenine when the thymine was replaced with adenine that resulted in the change in the uh, dna sequence the dna sequence change led to the change in rna sequence the rna sequence change led to the change in the mm -hmm. uh, uh, what amino acid is coming in place you know in total so that leads to the point mutation so when that happens because of the replacement of glutamic acid to valine now the 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 hemoglobin protein will not be as functional as before this is a defective protein when we have a defective protein they will not have the same capacity to carry the same amounts of oxygen when the hemoglobin lacks the capacity to carry the same amount of oxygen now this is called as low this will lead to low oxygen tension so this low oxygen tension will shift the biconcave shape of the red blood cell to the sickle cell so when it becomes sickle cell it leads to anemia so we know what is anemia when there is less red blood cells would carry oxygen so when you have anemia you have low blood count loss of appetite weakness and you will be very very lean and then you have you know, problems with your metabolism you have problems with your organs such as liver and kidney etc so this is about sickle cell anemia okay so anyways uh, we have a very short portion of the diseases that we have to talk uh, let let us not sincerely rush and finish off the topics okay we have the patients we'll take this class to the tomorrow and then we will talk about the remaining diseases and then we will conclude our class uh, for today and then we will also solve the questions which are neat grade okay which are very very important for neat all right students so if you have any doubts please leave a message in the chat box for the youtube students or uh, or you can uh, you know the the students who are in the zoom you can use the chat chat box to tell me if you have any doubts okay or any concerns all right students so have a nice weekend tomorrow and i will see you in the next class thank you very much for attending the class have a nice day